Customer education is such a potent marketing power. It can lead to increased product usage, higher customer satisfaction, and stronger brand loyalty. Now, Brian Childs, founder of Learning Outcomes, he has worked with companies like Moz, Todd Industries, and more. Today, he shares his customer training program scorecard. In episode 62 of the Marketing Power Up Show, you learn first of all why customer education is so important. Second, at which stage should companies care about customer education? Third, how to measure the ROI of customer education programs? And number four, a power up that has accelerated Brian's career. Before we get started, I've created a free power up cheat sheet that you can download and apply Brian's customer training program scorecard to your business. Get it now at marketingpowerups.com or find the link in the show notes and description. You ready? Let's go. Marketing Power Ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host, Ramley John. I'm so excited to come to have you come on the show to talk about yeah. training programs and customer education. Um, yeah. It's been a big part of my career. I've been, you know, in the training space for for some time. But you know, for people who are not familiar with it, you you built your career around around this, and now you have this company, uh, Learning Outcomes, which is built around around this this topic. Yeah. Why is it so important to you? Like this customer education and training. You might have you probably have seen it. Are you in your work and you've probably seen it in the companies and clients that you work with. Why customer education is, is so so important? Yeah. Well, I <clears throat> I mean I've had a lot of different roles in my life. Um, in my I've always enjoyed teaching. So I'd say that like uh, mm-hmm. one of the things for whatever, I mean, I don't know if you could measure it, but it's like the people who <laughs> tend to end up in this space like sharing information with other people. Um, and so that's just a quality that tends to exist with folks that are here. But I think for me, you know, it's like uh, way back in the day, I used to be a commercial pilot and uh, worked in aviation for about 10 years. And it was interesting to leave aviation and go into enterprise software Um <laughs> and B2B businesses. And it's like in aviation, you know, it's like we would train towards a very specific metric, which was like safety, you know? And so you'd have this, you'd literally have these stats down to like multiple decimal points in terms of like the, how to uh, impact and positively impact safety. And when I got into more business functions, it was as if like, you know, to take the equivalency of saying like, you know, we want to reduce crashes in planes. Um, (laughs) Oh, it was like, so, but every time like a customer churns, we're sort of like, that's like a plane just hitting a mountain, you know, I'm like, mm. but we're not looking at it yeah. at all. And and so there was this question of like, oper- you know, I'm also kind of an operations person. I think people in, uh, in customer education roles or training roles also tend to be somewhat operationally minded is you'd be like, what are the things that are contributing to these negative outcomes? Like, how can we root cause analysis that, uh, you know, provide a root cause analysis of that and figuring it out. And so I think that that aspect of trying to correlate what causes these negative aspects in businesses is just kind of generally interesting to me and then there's also this kind of people aspect up to it which is uh education and training is about changing human behavior and so you know it's like i have an undergrad in anthropology and so like even way back then it's like i kind of was drawn to like trying to understand like how human behaviors can be impacted, why people do things that they do. And so education is kind of like this marrying up of like an operations problem. So you're like, I got to figure out how I can drive this percent change on the back end of some activity along with like the percent changes that you're trying to impact are, are people's behaviors. And so training is a way that you can materially, uh, transform someone's trajectory through whatever it is that they're going to do, you know? And I, I mean, you could, it can be in software. It could be literally in anything, you know, it's like people learning to drive a car. If you just drop somebody in the car and go (laughs) knock yourself out, you know, it's like accident rates (laughs) quite high. It's like we train people on it because you're like, well, we got to have some expectation of that. You're able to control this thing. And that, that same concept can be applied to just about any, um, any business, any business problem. It's like, there's usually the training wrench can be applied in some way that tends to lead to like more positive outcomes. And so I'm attracted to that because, you know, it's like, I like producing business value um, and like um, you know, business strategy and operations and all that. So there's a lot of components that go into it. What I'm hearing is that, you know, the big part of it, I, I love that analogy with the, uh, with a car or even though with a plane, you're not going to, drop somebody in a plane and be like, fly, you know, 200 folks to, yeah. to Hawaii. 
without yeah. giving them the training. And I feel like sometimes that's what we do with our customers. We're like, for sure, here's the tool, go figure it out. <laughs> here's yeah. some product tours. And I think that's, uh, you know, without any thought around it, you're, you know, there's those kind of approaches set them up for failure. And yeah. really you're talking about like, how do you set up customers for, for success essentially, and make sure yeah. that they figure out how to use a tool and not just that, but like how, how to do their jobs better or what they do. Yeah. And, and I think the parallels, I mean, this is not a foreign concept to people who have backgrounds in marketing. Cause you could look at the, you know, if you think about <clears throat> sort of like a customer life cycle analysis where you'd say like, you know, we're going to have awareness campaigns and then like comparison compa- campaigns and conversion activities. It's like training activities are either run parallel to those or are part of those, you know, it's like you're educating people on your brand, you're educating people on the value that that brand produces and whatnot. And just like a marketing campaign, you know, it can be done poorly really easily. Um, But uh, just like a marketing campaign, you know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to eliminate, um, you're trying to eliminate and streamline the flow of people towards the value that you provide. And, right. and so like if I'm, you know, launching a email campaign and I want to send them to a landing page and I want the CTA to take them to the whatever, you know, it's like all along that path, you have little measurements that you can look at to say like, you know, page views versus conversion rates versus button clicks or whatever. <clears throat> and it's really no different in training. Like you're still just trying to streamline and eliminate um, any kind of blockage within that flow. It's just the value, the the main value metric that you'd be measuring against is is further down the path mm-hmm. than purely just like a sale. Like you would look at it as be like, I'm gonna take that that main metric that I want, which is like maybe sales qualified leads, and I'm just gonna move that further down the customer lifecycle and say, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna do all those same things, but then I'm gonna actually measure against the adoption rate of the customers that come through. And so all it's doing is moving your main metric further down the path and yet you can still retain all of those same sort of Mm. like um, interstitial measurements along the way. So it marries very closely to the way that marketing is because marketing is still a human, you're still trying to impact people's behaviors to go towards the value that you're producing and follow that. I I love how you keep, this is like the third or fourth time you mentioned how this is really about changing behaviors and really Mm. that's what it's about, you know, like, people are not just adopting a product. They're actually have to change their behavior around it, especially, especially if it's a, maybe a new product and they're moving away from spreadsheets mm. <laughs> or, so, yeah, or like sure. nothing, yeah, right. you know, sometimes no right. tool at all where like yeah. there is a new habit they have to form essentially and training can really yeah. help with that. Yeah. You mentioned around, um, you know, the impact to it is, uh, it's around reducing churn. Have you seen any, you know, any ranges of like how, yeah, I guess I'm trying to get at is like, how do you uh, prove ROI around this and show that there's impact in when you're creating this, this programs to, you know, to leadership specifically? Yeah, so I, I would say that there's probably, there's a couple different ways of looking at the ROI question. Um, and I think it depends on where the program is originating. So uh, if it's originating or it's sort of like if you're looking for the ROI through the lens of maybe marketing, um, there's a couple ways of looking at it. There's also ways of looking at it through the lens of customer success. Um, and so when it comes to marketing folks or marketing minded folks, I would look at training activities as no different than a product. So it's like it's a product or a feature. When you're launching a training initiative, you are launching a product or a service, right? And so they have a lot of the same qualities as a product. You have to focus on, are people going to be aware of this? Are they going to adopt it? Are they going to engage in it? Um, you know, are they going to continue and repeat and, and drive repeat usage within it? it? Has all those same qualities within it. And so um, it helps to look at it through that lens. And so then when you think about the ROI, what you could be looking at then is a uptick in the customer lifetime value, right? And so customer lifetime value, if you, it's, it can be sort of a conceptual idea, or you could just tie it to, to dollars like or, or money, mm-hmm. whatever. 
And so it's best if you can tie it to, to money and say like, look, we are going to launch a training initiative or I'm going to take on the marketing of a training initiative and we're going to try to drive, you know, uh, an increase in customer lifetime value. So things that make that a little bit easier um, are, you know, you could you could look at it two ways. One is either I'm going to increase the size of the or increase the number of people that I'm pushing into my campaigns or pushing into my like sales qualified lead funnel. Right. That's one way of increasing it is it's purely like I'm going to increase the number of people that are going into it. And so therefore, like I can have you know, an increase in revenue. If you want to use like a pure, like customer lifetime value for like an individual account, then what you'd say is like, it's the number of people who are maybe like interacting with this training. Um, But I would look at it with those kinds of ROI metrics through for the lens of a marketing person is like customer lifetime value is really what you're trying to impact. Um, Some, some ways to do that that are sort of like the easy ways to do that is charge for training, right? Have it be something that's like a professional service or, you know, tie a dollar amount to it. That is, um, is particularly impactful for like B2C companies that have a, like a monthly SaaS business model, because oftentimes with B2C companies that have monthly SaaS or like some kind of like free trial or whatever, you see fairly horrific drop-offs after your first month that like month zero to month one drop off is like a huge problem. Right. Or, or even if you look at the, the first three months of a typical account, you would say like, you see pretty significant drop off rates in those first three months. And so training becomes a good upsell opportunity for people that are trying to learn a product. So when I'm comparing a couple of different products, um, if I'm selling training, this is a way to sort of like attach a feature to them that's a paid feature where you could say like, yeah, we charge, you know, back in the day, whatever, $19.99 a month, maybe it's probably like $79 a month now. But like, you know, if we can, if we can add an additional $299 in like a training program to that or $4.99 or something where it's just like, look, this is a boot camp and attach that to those accounts, you will see a dramatic increase in the value of your, of a place that typically is like a low value segment, which is like all those people that drop off the first three months. It's like, what if you could increase them from being a, you know, a $79 account uh, or a a lifetime value to like a 579. And so training is a great way to do that if you think about it as a product. Um, Yeah. And I'd say that like on the success operations, those become the customer lifetime value question becomes a little bit more of a um, retention challenge. So that, you know, like that's not necessarily tends to be a marketing problem, but like if you, you can think about this value also in terms of like increasing customer lifetime value over a much longer period of time. And that becomes more of like a retention play. And those retention plays would say that like deeper adoption of your product um, will result in the actualization or realization of more value from what you provide. And so a higher likely stickiness rate. Because <clears throat> um, what often happens with most, you know, the people don't like to admit this, but with a lot of SaaS businesses, m- the majority of accounts will only use a very small number of the features that you have. And so if you can get greater penetration, then you unlock all that value of all that product that you've invested in building. So there's a couple of different ways to look at it, but I I generally look at the ROI as being like a customer lifetime value increase, whether or not that's through sales or through retained revenue. I really like the, the, the lenses that you put there where in the marketing side, I guess that was one of the side questions I had for you around like whether you should charge for it or not. And you kind of answered it there. Um, um, do you have any guidelines around that where, you know, it's, it's, I see some companies that do charge for, let's say Salesforce, they, they mm-hmm. charge for yeah. their training <laughs> right. versus something like, I'm not sure, something smaller like Pipe. Uh, I forgot that company that's like smaller, but like they don't charge for their training. Yeah, It, it might depend on segment, but do you have any advice for people specifically if they come to you and ask you, hey, Brian, should we charge for our training program <laughs> or uh, uh, 500 bucks or like 30 bucks or, or not? Yeah. What would be your, I, your advice to them? Yeah, my advice, is, it's pretty simple advice. My advice is that if you're training about your product, then it's probably free. If you're right. training about how to do the job, 
related to your product. Mm-hmm. Now it's a <clears throat> now you have a capacity development on the team, and that's that's of extreme value. And maybe an analogy would be like, um, you bought you buy a car, okay, with every car or a, you know a lawnmower, or whatever. It's like when you right. buy something, there's this little book that comes along with it. That's like, here's how to put the oil in, and here's like what the yeah. lights mean, or whatever, right? That comes with the car. They, if they're charging you for it, you know, like go to a different dealership. But like, <laughs> uh, you know, but nonetheless, it's like when you get that little manual that goes along with the thing that you're, you've purchased. That's free. And the expectation in the market is that's free. It's like, you shouldn't charge me to use your tool. For some enterprise platforms, there's a professional service that goes along with it, which people expect. But for the most part, like, that's not, that's like professional service, not necessarily like a training program. It's more like an onboarding expectation. If you're going to go move into helping that person do their job better, regardless of what tool they're using. If it's your tool, if it's your competitor's tool, whatever concepts, I'll I'll use an example. You know, I worked for uh, Moz. It was a search engine optimization software. I used to run boot camps on how to do search engine optimization. We would sprinkle in Moz, you know, into this because it's like, obviously that was (laughs) a tool that we had access to. I mean, I had admin access to this thing. So it's like, I would do it. But the concepts that were there were more like how to do this effectively, regardless of what tool you use. If you get into that stuff, you are building a, a, a capability on, on your customer's right. team. And that is, you, you know, you're sort of, you're sort of starting to like, uh, move into places where like the university and education systems have failed where you're like, if you can't find <laughs> this information elsewhere, right. We as a brand are going to do it. And it's really, really powerful. It's a place where mm-hmm. brands can move in and say like, not only do we build this, but we really know this stuff. Um, and that's a, that's a really, it's a, that's the distinction that I make. You're talking about your product yeah. for B2C. It's probably free. If you're talking about how to do the job and do your job better and the best practices, now you got your, you got the rudiments of a, of a paid training program. Hmm. And, and, and the really payment, more about- the payment Sorry, increases but- the value, the perceived value too. That's the other thing too, yeah, is like, true. sometimes people will be like, yeah. Oh, I don't want to charge that much. I'm like, charge for it. Charge, see what people will pay because the willingness to pay for that kind of information can be quite high. Yeah. That, that really gets more into career development or like uh, skill development where, mm-hmm. you know, they have a certain budget. You know, most people yep. in, in working in companies have a certain budget for training and yep. this helps them do their job better or especially with certification programs as well. It makes them look yep. more hireable per se. Um, yep. You know, if they're looking to go to another workplace where, you know, I'm I'm not sure if there's Moss certified, but it was or SEO certified by Moss. That looks yeah. good to them. Yeah. yeah. Badging programs um, are huge. Skills based training is going to continue to increase. I mean, I just heard some metric that like, <clears throat> you know, 50 percent of families right now don't know whether or not like the value of a higher education is worth it. So compare that to 10 years ago where like 95 or 99% of people thought that higher education was an essential thing. It's like that, that, uh, edifice in our society is degrading and it's degrading quickly. People still need to develop skills. They still need to build a, you know, uh, constellation of capabilities that are going to help them within the job market. But the idea that the higher education system is going to be the place where you go for that is dramatically changing. And I think brands have a huge opportunity to step so into true. that and say, like, we can capitalize on that value. We can we can create the um, infrastructure around that knowledge and be the place to know about it for most most activities that we are involved in, right? Like anything that we do, there's usually only a couple really good ways to do it. And if you can mm-hmm. just be like, we're just going to document it and create the training for it and teach exactly how to do it. You can put your brand right in the middle of that conversation um, and sort of capitalize on that. I, I think that that's slowly happening, but I would expect that over the course of the next couple of years, it's going to accelerate as people get into more skills-based training and wake up to the realities of like what yeah. a badging um, and skills-based badging system can do. What I'm seeing also as an added benefit to that is, 
the whole brand perspective where because Moss trained me on this, now I, ha- I feel good about Moss. Mm-hmm. For sure. <laughs> so to yeah. speak, they've helped me get the next job that I have yeah. where I'm more likely to bring Moss to my next job. It's such yeah. an important play. We've seen this with HubSpot. We have a Spot Academy mm-hmm. where yeah, sure. they really, you know, they really um, make them, people feel good about them because they have free training program. But they, it's just built this like relationship with people that they feel good about the brand and they use it because of that, essentially. Yeah. I mean, there is a thing that I'll often repeat, which is, you know, people only learn something the first time once. So think mm-hmm. about that. You only, you, you only learn something the first time once. And if you're the brand that is the one that mm-hmm. teaches you the first time, that's a special place that you hold with them, yeah, you know, that's true. and, uh, and it's interesting cause we're talking about, uh, training, right. We're, we're, we're kind of like talking about what training programs can do, but think about how important brand positioning is and how difficult it is to build a brand like that is noticeable training for marketers should be a place that they look to. Uh, to establish that brand positioning. It's relatively easy, right? You could be like, oh, we're going to be the Apple of whatever. And it's like, <laughs> that's really hard. You know, that's a, that's a hard thing to break out with. And because yes. you can say it, Costs you can tell me all day long. You're like, yeah, we're the Apple right. of whatever. And I'm like, eh, like maybe. But if you're the place where I go to learn about it, now we have a special relationship. And you have a, and, and I have a, we have a special reason, right? If you think about lower down on the, the, uh, the sales funnel, now I have a very special reason to come back to you and see how that training impacted your life. You know, like think about a BDR that's been trained or an SDR that's been trained to go and be like, so how, how did that go? Like, what, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since you've done that. Anything going on? You can create your funnel around that brand positioning that's around training. Yeah. And instead of it being a cold, e- you know, a cold email or a cold call being like, hey, can I buy you an Amazon card or whatever? <laughs> you know, like no one likes that. But if it's all yeah. of a sudden like this consultative approach where like we gave you some tools, are you using them? You're you're deep into the sale all of a sudden. And I'll and I'll add another thing to this as well for for marketers to consider is go to your sales organization, go to like your demand gen team, your sales ops team. <clears throat> and ask them, um, what are the hard things to do in qualification? So you're, you know, you got these BDRs that are out there who have an, uh, a marketing qualified lead and they got to get on the phone or send an email and they got to go dig into a couple specific pieces of information to turn them into an SQL training because it's so, because you end up talking about things in such an open way. If you structure it in a way where you're asking people questions about their organizations or about their roles, you can collect pieces of information that are those so hard cool. to gather yeah. SQL bant, you know, whatever you bant or medic, whatever your qualification criteria <laughs> is. You can you can ask somebody in a training organization, well, what kind of budget are you working with? And it's not going to come off as sounding like a sales pitch, but you can if you can do that in a way that captures it in a in structured data, you can attach that to their account. So training is also not only is it a brand position, it's a huge opportunity to collect sales qualified lead criteria so you can move people quickly down the funnel and apply your sales resources in a much more sophisticated way that is just blowing my mind i don't don't see a lot of organizations doing have you seen any companies like do that well where like they've really integrated a training program into um their sales process or qualification process it's new I'll, I'll say that like when I when I talk about this to other pro, to companies, they're like, you know, like, oh, my God, but, you know, <laughs> right. But but I'm like, but I'll often show them examples that are not training examples where they can see where it's like this is a thing that like we're actually pretty familiar with. It's just not a thing that people really pull on from a training yeah. standpoint, because, again, the, the challenge with like a sales qualified lead conversation is that no one likes to be sold to and our phones won't mm. even let like BDRs call me anymore. They'll be like spam. And I'm like, you know, like good it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, I'll give, I'll give you a non-training example where this is, where this is the case. Okay. So when I go to, you know, Zillow or Redfin or something like that, it's like, and I'm going to plug in information about my, you know, mortgage calculator or whatever. 
these kinds of calculators that are out there where people are plugging in information that's going to help me, you know, determine what I can do or whatever. You know, if you're like a, I don't know, like a dev, like say like a DevOps software, right? And you're like, well, tell, like fill this out and provide some, you know, provide some information in this training environment or we're going to do an exercise. We're going to look at like blah, blah, blah. And like, we're going to put, you're going to put some information in about maybe like your, the size of your network or the, the needs that you have around security issues, go and look at any time you've ever filled out a calculator that's associated with your, with your own, you know, whatever thing you're, you're interested in. And imagine what if you could have that data and hand that data over to your sales organization yeah, or that they have that a sales awesome. organization that's sort of like this guy put in, you know, he wants to buy a house. that's like 200,000 versus 2 million. Well, there's a big difference between that person that we're going to put the AE on the person that has like the $2 million budget, not the $200,000 budget. So it's still pretty new, but realize that this is a thing that you can do uh, with training is it, it's a, it's a very special relationship. It's a low barrier relationship and people like to share in that training experience where if you can tie that into your, your account record in Salesforce, really, really amazing things happen. It takes a lot of coordination with your sales org though. Actually, funny. Uh, I'm actually going to bring up your your updated training program scorecard because yeah. uh, so it grades programs based on four found the uh, dimensions: structure, integration, yeah. uh, resourcing, and process. One of the questions I remember was like, "Does your <laughs> does your program integrate with your your CRM?" And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. this is all like kind of connecting together essentially. But yeah. you've you've launched this, relaunched this scorecard. It's like updated. Uh, I'm curious, like. You must you must start seeing patterns in terms of the data. Oh, yeah. Are there any specific pattern in terms of like where programs need help the most, or any other interesting patterns you've seen based on conversations or the data you, that you're getting through through the scorecard? Yeah. So the scorecard uh, that you're talking about is uh, we relaunched this thing uh, on learning outcomes, which is uh, an opportunity for program leaders to get uh, an assessment um, of their program. And, and like you say, we measure on four different dimensions. Um, and then it, it creates a little report, gives you a score across these four different dimensions. And in that report, what people are doing or what they're telling me they're doing is they're taking that report and they go and have, and that, that's a good way to sort of like start a conversation with the your yeah. executive sponsors and be like, look, you know, like these are the areas we need to really focus on. So I'll, I'll take you behind the scenes on what's going on with the scorecard a little bit. The scorecard is measuring two different main dimensions. Okay. Those two different dimensions are the person who's filling it out and the organization that they're in. And I'll use an analogy to say that like, um, you know, if you go try to plant an, an apple tree in concrete, you're not going to really get a lot of apples out of it. Right. So it's like you could have a sophisticated, viable program leader, but your organization might not be set up to make or capitalize on that person's capabilities. And so this scorecard really measures these two different things. One is, there's a lot of questions in there that are about you. So it's like, do you do this? All do right. you have, like, what are the capabilities you bring to the table? And there's a lot of stuff that talks about, like, how siloed is your organization? Like, mm -hmm. do people share backlogs? Do they, you know, these things that are re relevant to the organization. And so what the interesting aspect of, of the data that's coming out of it, and maybe this is no surprise, but it's like the people who are taking it more often than not are scoring relatively high on the things that they themselves are in control of. So right. maybe you've worked in these roles before. Maybe you've done these kinds of activities before. Maybe you have a good sense of process and you know the language of how to do all of this. You can execute it if given the opportunity. The biggest challenges are faced at the organizational level siloing, a lack of shared backlogs, uh, a lack of cross-functional engagement, those kinds of things. So it's like, even if I was to give you all the power in the world and the biggest budget in the world possible, the organization that you're working in is not ready to capitalize on the opportunity of customer education. And I would argue that these, the same kinds of things, the similar types of questions could be said about sophisticated marketing campaigns, where it's like, you might be a really great marketer, but the organization that you're planted in is not really capable of doing, of executing what is required, which is like a, a cross-functional engagement with a customer that follows them down the life cycle and keeps, 
you know, keeps the value story consistent throughout the whole thing, all the way to the point where they, they buy and adopt your solution. That's so, yeah, I've seen that time and time again. It, it seems like it's, it, it's, it's more organizational slash political issue or more like a data issue or maybe both where like systems are not talking to each other and the organization hasn't, I guess, set all the pipeline and all the process in place so that they can take advantage of the program, the training program more across the org. Yeah, I would. <clears throat> I think you're touching on the two. So there's really three. There's three dimensions. So I'm mentioning one is like the person, and the other is the organization. I would break the organization into two aspects, and you can think of this as a two by two matrix. So if you want to, like, you know, if, you, if your audience wants to visualize this, <laughs> the two by two is. Uh, I do love a two by two. Um, the two by two is uh, on one side would be data architecture, right? Uh, and so data architecture would be like how do you store right. it? How do you join it? The availability of, of analysis, like. To what degree are you able to ask sophisticated questions of your data? And by your data, I mean across all of the different systems that you have. The other dimension, so one would be data architecture. The other dimension would be cross-functional collaboration. Mm. So to what degree do different teams across your customer lifecycle work together or don't to set priorities? So those are, those are the two that's on the side of the, the, custo- of, of, of the, uh, the company. It'd be like data architecture, cross-functional collaboration. If you don't have good data architecture, you're not going to be able to answer sophisticated questions. It doesn't matter if you want to be like, we want to hit retention. It's like, if you can't measure things right. with data, very, very hard. The cross-functional collaboration, I would say, is probably the, both of these are significant, but I'd say the cross-functional collaboration is a thing that people verbalize a lot more, which is like, we're so siloed, or these other people are doing this other thing over here, that sort of thing. So the third dimension would be the thing that's related to the program later. And, and I, would, I would simplify the qualification of this is, is just, have you done this before? So if a program, so you have this two by two matrix, so you can be like, here's where our organization is. And then you could lay on top of that the, the program leader's experience. And you could say, if the organization has a high sophistication of data, uh, the u- use of data, and a high degree of cross-functional collaboration, that represents the potential for mm-hmm. customer education. I would even argue like sophisticated marketing programs. Then you put on your leader on that and say, can they you know, execute or take advantage of that opportunity that's presented by the organization? And that will rely on the experience of the program leader. And so in this scorecard, this scorecard functionally measures these things. So you're, you know, what it does, it kicks out a score that says to the degree that which, you know, based upon the questions, we can assess whether or not you have the potential around your data to impact the kinds of things where customer education can play a role. Is there cross-functional collaboration taking place? And do you have the experience to be able to make or capitalize on the opportunity that's presented by your organization? And more often than not, the likelihood is that the person who's taking it has, has the process knowledge to be able to capitalize right. on it, but the organization itself either right. lacks the data architecture or the cross-functional collaboration or both to high degrees. And so those would be things where it'd be like, if you're going to focus on something, focus on impacting those two aspects. Interesting. That's, that's just blowing my mind. I think that makes a ton of sense. I've seen a lot of organizations who have, who who struggle with that as well. I guess it's also like evangelizing the training program within the organization is what I'm hearing where you're like, really like, here's what we could achieve with this. We can, you know, what you mentioned earlier around like using the data for the sales process or impacting uh, in terms of like customer lifetime value. And this is what resources I need to to get that installed really is is what hindering a lot of training programs to reach its full potential is what I'm hearing you saying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's the classic like uh, best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. Next best time is today. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, it's like recognizing that um, I think the most imp- the most important like outcome of some of that is just is being able to have a conversation about where the priorities lie. And, and honestly, like whether or not the organization really wants it, they could say that they want to have this kind of sophisticated program and they want to do these kinds right. of impacts. But at the end of the day, training training programs, customer education, it's just a, it's a wrench, you know? So it's like, if I got a wrench and, right. and like, it's a, it's a solution in search of a problem. So I think the first, the first thing to ask is what are we trying to solve? 
if if I'm talking to an organization that says like they have the problem around like this, you know, maybe lead qualification or whatever, it's like, okay, well then let's talk about all the different potential ways that we could solve that. If they want to solve a retention problem, then I would say, well, customer education is a very like successful way of doing it, but to do it, we need to recognize that the journey that we're going to take to get there is going to be about us having a very informed conversation about our data architecture and a cross-functional collaboration. If we're not willing to talk about cross-functional collaboration data, then we're not really talking about driving retention. Yeah. You know, you're, you're trying to plant some magic beans in some poor customer education leader, you know, and have it's them so just kind of like, they're right. trying to like, I'm going to be an apple tree that we're going to build them like right in the middle of a freeway. You know, it's like, that's, you're not going to get any apples off of that thing. I love it. I, I appreciate all this knowledge issue you've, you've been sharing now. Uh, with the beans and the driving. And, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm just like an it's analogy. so good. Right? I'm like beans good. and apples and roads. You're like, okay, man, where, where's the thread? <laughs> it's, it's good because like it's such a great education uh, technique where, you know, especially with um, with very, uh, you know, non-tactical or non-physical concepts, you can, people can visualize it. So I mm. do appreciate it. Yeah. I, I want to ask around um, what, specifically a company that you or you've worked with in the past or you've seen where their their training program is is world class is there one that sticks out for you or like you know if people are going to check out what training program should look like on the like on the outside you should check out this this company is there any ones that specifically stand out for you that you've seen in, in the past or um you know well i i would i would go back to the statements around so rather than saying like this brand does it really well, I, I think it's important, you know, like you could point at HubSpot and be like HubSpot Academy and like Courtney Sambler and whatever, she, you know, what she does is like really incredible. But the qualities that make it, it's, I think it's better to focus on what are the qualities that would make for a good program rather than like, why is it good? Mm -hmm. Because it's very easy to look at some programs, particularly smaller, like uh, maybe like mid market SaaS companies. And what you're observing from the outside is like, Herculean effort on the part of a individual or small group of people that are like pushing that forward and that like they might be working against headwinds. So it's kind of hard to tell from the outside sometimes when you're looking at a program yeah. as to what's actually functionally causing it. I would, I would encourage people to uh, think about and develop ways or use things like the scorecard. You can use the scorecard when you're, when you're going and, um, as an interview guide too. So if you're like looking for work in customer education, you know, ask those questions to the idea. company that you're interviewing <laughs> and like get, get them to divulge right. those things. Cause if you can, you can build a profile around it. The, it's not the, it's not that a company is doing it really well. The question is what are the underlying factors mm. that are resulting in a company being able to do it well? And each one of those cross-functional collaboration, data architecture, program leadership, each one of those can change. So what was good two years ago at a company, maybe through a reorg or through the, the realities of, you know, budget changes or a person left and got a new job, each one of those could dramatically change like the current state, even if they were really good a couple of years ago. So I would, I would uh, refrain from like, saying this company is doing it well and I, and I encourage people rather to like understand that the fundamental architecture of what causes programs to be good um, is is more is more important than the, the brand name itself there are good programs out there but I'd say I'd equally say that there are really really phenomenal people driving them and they might mm. be working against severe headwinds to do it all right, I will link the, the scorecard. I love that a suggestion. If you're going to do an interview about customer education, ask them those those questions. That will be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The original the original version I ever built with those things was actually like an interview guide for myself <laughs> when I was like looking at programs. I'm like, I don't want to go into dumpster fire. So like, how can I avoid this? You know, and like get people to answer questions that they don't. I was doing my own like SQLs. You know, I'm just sort of like, is this a sales qualified lead for me to join this company? So like that, use it in that way if you want. So like, I don't care if people oh, fill yeah. it out multiple, multiple times. Oh. I love it. Uh, I want to shift gears and talk about career power-ups. I know you've been in marketing now for a bit. Like, and you, you mentioned some of the companies you worked with, Moz. Um, looking at your LinkedIn profile, you also work at Thought Industries and GE. Mm -hmm. What's a power-up that's helped you accelerate your career? And it could be something that's you know a concept or it could be uh, something that's 
specific to marketing? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I have this this habit that I developed that comes from I, w- I was an undergrad in uh, cultur- cultural anthropology. OK. And so I, I do this thing that I call creating a, a star map of an organization. OK, so think of it as like trying to diagram the constellation. And in anthropology, um, one of the activities that you do is developing a power structure um, diagram of a community. And I will develop a power structure diagram of organizations um, to try to determine where uh, reputational power or influence comes from. Um, And so here's the way I do it is when I enter an organization, Um, particularly in the very beginning, I will keep track of where people point to when you ask who knows this information and be very intentional about it. Be like, oh, oh, this is a really interesting report or is it really or who knows? You know, I'm trying to figure out about X. Who knows about that? Keep track of the person that you're talking to and who they point you to. What you're going to find is that People, after you ask the same question, like who knows the most about, you know, um, uh, our data analysis or who knows the most about like the Salesforce, like what's going on in Salesforce. After you talk to enough people, everyone starts pointing to the same person. Usually, like you'll find that like information resides in very few people in an organization. And those Mm. people, because they own the information, because they're relied on by everybody else, they have an outsized impact on decision making. Mm. And so being able and oftentimes, particularly in like engineering or or like very uh, technical kinds of organizations, like when I worked at GE, Those people are not the ones that get invited to like leadership meetings. They're the ones that are like down in the basement crunching numbers the whole time, but they have, they might not be in the meeting, but you know what? They are in the meeting because everybody else is relying on their version of what that, of the information that they think that that person knows. And so if you can identify who those people are, if you can create a star map, so like think of the stars of an organization, if you can create a star map, you're going to find out you know, developing relationships with those people gives you an inordinate amount of power in an organization because you can then say like, well, I was talking to Jerry and Jerry, you know, as a person who knows Jerry and they're like, you know, Jerry, like if you can get to be that person's friend, um, you can get direct access to a lot of, to a lot of influence. And more importantly, you can skip past a lot of what is derived knowledge. And in organizations, there tends to be a lot of derived knowledge of people who like saw a report that that person made and that's their interpretation of it. And it's like, it's kind of this whole go to the uh, primary source material. And, and if you ask questions of who knows this and keep track and be like, this person said that there was that person, this person said it was that person, this person said it was this other person over there. And then when I asked them, they said it was the same person. So you can start like realizing that everybody's actually just referencing very few sources of information. It's a it's a hack to get to uh, where like the that. power and influential <laughs> power resides within an organization. Right. So create a star map. I would not. Uh, that's such an interesting uh, advice. I'm trying to like. I'm going to try this out. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to try this out where I work at uh, at AppQs and see. And see how it goes. I guess it also depends yeah. on the con- uh, what you're asking for. Like if if it's about Salesforce, Jerry. If it's about I don't know um, another topic around our CRM or maybe um, not, our email marketing program, it would be this person. So now you're you might have different maps based on specific knowledge. Is that yeah. how you're thinking yeah, about yeah. that? Yeah, you'll end up. What you'll end up with is you'll end up with a with a lot of people pointing to the same individuals around mm. the most important topics or the most important pieces of information within a company. And so there'll be a lot of stuff that's just sort of like, I don't know, everybody knows, Hub, you know, like there's some people that know HubSpot. So sometimes it'll be like, who knows a tool best? And that's helpful because you can skip past a lot of folks. The more interesting things are around to extend sort of the cultural anthropology analogy here is it's like, to understand the ethnography of an organization to be like, Mm. which of these people, maybe they're not the CEO, maybe they're not even the senior executives, which of these people are the ones that are describing for this entire organization, how the sun goes up and down in our world. You know, like why do we believe 
that this is what the competitive landscape looks like? Well, it's like it might be because there's one or two people that either have data or have a tremendous amount of influence on the way that the perception is. If you can understand that, it's like you can just short circuit a lot of the like the the the, the cross functional inefficiency that goes with hierarchy and just go directly to those sources and be like, hey, I have a couple questions. Tell me how this works. And you can get right to the individuals that have that. I love that. And it's all about like what you mentioned earlier around like you know, helping you get buy-in, cross-functional collaboration, and uh, you know really helping you uh, level up, I guess, and get get stuff going if you need to. Yeah, yeah. It's like use the influence of the organization to your advantage, and and that and and oftentimes, more often than not, it is uh, disconnected from the the hierarchies that are installed mm. around leadership structure. Oftentimes there's a whole separate, invisible, horizontal aspect to it about like how information flows through organizations. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power-Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use, hit their KPIs consistently, and wow their colleagues. I want to say thank you to you for listening and please like and follow Marketing Power Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you feel extra generous, kind of leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way in others finding out about Marketing Power Ups. Thanks to Mary Sullivan for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Kaigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered update. Marketing power-ups until the next episode <laughs>